Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Just another beautiful day that the Lord's blessed us with. Uh, sitting out on the back patio early this morning with a cup of coffee. Got to hear the patter of a few raindrops, which we desperately need around our house. And, uh, so that was that was good. Sit there and enjoy the early morning. And, uh, just know that God's made us another day filled with His mercy and His grace. And we're very thankful for that. All other ground is sinking sand. Thankful. Again, say that we're thankful to see everybody here this morning. Thankful for God's grace and mercy. Thankful for those that have been traveling to now be back home and back with us. We trust that we have come this morning for the purpose of honoring and glorifying the true and living God. Certainly there is no greater reason for us to be here than that. We well, invite you to turn this morning to 1 John chapter 5 and beginning at verse 1. 1 John 5 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. One of the wonderful things about John's letters to me is that he continually gives us things that affirm to us that we have the ability and the grace to realize that we have a relationship with God and with our Lord Jesus Christ that is not just imagined or is not just wishful thinking, but that there are benchmarks that we can have that we have that assure us that this is true. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? You see, that's, that's an important question. And, and, and immediately, everybody that, that, that claims to be affiliated in any way, shape, or fashion with the Christian faith is going to immediately say, Absolutely. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Do you believe that he's the only begotten son of God? Do you believe that he was born of a virgin? Do you believe that he is the only way to God? Because you see, if you don't believe that, then you don't really believe that Jesus is the Christ. And I find a lot of, of God's children in the world today that, that, that begin to waffle and begin to try to tell you what Jesus is a way to God, but he's not the only way to God. I want you to understand this morning that the word of God says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So that tells me that there's no other way or truth or life outside of Jesus Christ. He said of himself, I am the resurrection. So that tells me that there's no other resurrecting power outside of that that raised up Jesus from the dead. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ. You see, that takes more than just 
spout those words out of your mouth. Do you believe he is the only means of your salvation and the only way that you will have ever be able to attain unto God's holy presence here or hereafter. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now the other thing about John's letters, John's letters are written particularly to the elect lady and her children. John's letters are written, I believe, specifically to the church of God, to the church of Jesus Christ, to the visible church here in the world. Very specific address. For a very specific reason. This is to ensure and encourage the church in its labor and in its journey and in its walk because, I, and, and again, I want you, you know, I hope we all understand, this is a meeting house. And I, I want to have you may refer to it as Providence Meeting House. This is not Providence Church. I'm looking at Providence Church, and it's not the building that surrounds me. It's the people that sit in front of me. You are Providence Church. Or more correctly, I should say, perhaps, that you are the Church of Jesus Christ at Providence. These words are written for an encouragement to the church. I know there have been a lot of times through history when the church needed encouragement, when the church needed to be reminded of these things that are true. Again, I want you to know this morning, I, I realize that, that you come here on Sunday mornings, you probably hear things that you've heard all your life and, and things that you're firmly grounded in and things that you readily believe. But I'm going to tell you something. God forbid that you ever come here and I tell you something new. Now, he might bless us from time to time to see in his word, to have revealed to us out of his word an understanding that we hadn't had before. But the things of God are not new. The things of God are eternal. They have ever been and they ever will be. I don't come to express to you new thoughts and new ideas. I come, I hope, by the grace of God for the same reason that Peter said he wrote his letters, to stir up your pure hearts and your pure minds in a way of remembrance. I believe it was even John and, and at some point said, I don't tell you these things because you don't know them. I tell them to you because you do know them. Everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. You can't claim to love God if you don't love Jesus. And you can't claim to love Jesus if you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, I don't mean that to sound harsh. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. This is not just my thought or my idea. It's, it's, it's not just my notion. And, and, and sometimes in this world of political correctness, we try to water down God's Word. because we don't want to offend people. And I want you to understand this morning, it is not my purpose ever to offend any of God's children, regardless of what they believe or how they feel or, or what their understanding is. It is never my intention. And I used to be concerned about that a great deal because I understood that a lot of times the gospel that we preach from the Word of God seems to offend people. Sometimes it offends them bad enough that they don't come back. And, I, and I, I was, you know, that concerned me because the Bible plainly tells me that I'm not to offend one of God's little ones. That I am not to give offense. Thank God, by His grace, I finally came to realize one day that there's a difference in people taking offense and me giving offense. 
I'm not responsible for how you receive God's word. I'm responsible for, re for preaching God's word and all, with all the love and the grace and the mercy that he will pour out upon me and that he will allow me to display. And I pray that I never handle his word in any way but with love. the love of God offends you, if the love of Christ offends you, if him being your absolute all in all offends you, first of all, know that it is not my intention to give offense. But at the same time, I finally realized that I have no control over whether or not you take offense. And the what I was commanded was not to give offense. So know that it is never my intention to offend you. It is never my intention to hurt your feelings. It is never my intention to cause you to think less of the church or less of yourself or less of me. My intention is that we think more of God and more of his truth and more of his will and more of his power. <clears throat> Everyone that loveth him that began. That's the Father. He's the one that began. Loveth him also that is begotten of him. You can't love one and not love the other. By this, we know that we love the children of God. You can't love him that begat. And you see, if we are the church, if we are God's children, if we are his people, I cannot claim or pretend in any way, shape, form, or fashion to love God and not love you. Sometimes love's a hard lesson. Sometimes love's a hard lesson. There were times in my life that, that, that love came at the end of a little switch. Didn't feel much like love right at the time. But looking back, I know that that's exactly what it was. Because I know there were times that my little tender hearted mama administered that switch and then went off somewhere where I couldn't see her and sit down and cry. Probably more than I did. Love is sometimes a hard lesson. Love does not always necessarily mean kind words, but love means words given from a kind heart, from a loving heart, from a loving attitude. If we correct one another, if we chasten one another, if we admonish one another, God forbid that it be from any cause other than the love that we have for him and therefore the love that we have for his people. I dare say that most of us have, under, have, have experienced by now that God's love includes bringing us down a peg or two when we need it. Doesn't mean he doesn't love us. As a matter of fact, it means just the opposite of that. It also doesn't mean that I always like it right at the time. My old carnal nature. We see again, thank God, we grow in grace and in knowledge of the truth. We come to that. I, you know, I have come to the point that, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I enjoy the chastening of God, but I love being chastened by God because it lets me know that his eye is ever on me, that he has not forgotten me, that he has not abandoned me, and that he has not left me to my own devices. There's been a time or two in my life that he's let me have my own devices. It wasn't pretty. But you see, again, that was a lesson of love. That was a lesson of love. There were a few times in my life that, that my dad let me have my way about a few things. He kept me, okay, buddy, it's your head. You go ahead and butt me. And I soon discovered that when he told me that, I might as well be braced for a little pain because it generally wasn't going to work out well. 
By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Because you see, if we love God, we're going to keep His commandments. We're going to do the things that He says for us to do. No, we're never going to be perfect at it. No, we're not going to be flawless with it. But our desire and our purpose are going to be to keep His commandments. My dad's 92 years old, and I guess, you know, if, if it came right down to a wrestling match today, I'd probably win. But I'm going to tell you something. If my daddy calls me up there and says, son, I need you too, if there's any way in my power, I'm going to do it. And if he calls me up and says to me, son, I know this is going on and you need to, you need to quit that, I'm going to pay attention. Because he's proven to me without any doubt that his motivation in my life has always been his love for me. You see, if my father, who is like I am, a sinner, and fallible, and, and imperfect, if I have the, the, the grace to understand that in my love for him, I would do the things that he has bidden me do. How much simpler and how much greater should it be for us to know that, that God our Father who loves us to perfection, that we should strive to keep his commandments. And not just the ones that I like. You see, I don't get to pick <clears throat> what part of his word I'm going to believe. Because if I can't believe all of it, then I can't believe any of it. If I'm going to take the position that this scripture doesn't mean what it says, then I don't have any assurance that any of them mean what they say. If I'm going to take the position that this part of the Bible is inspired by God, but this part isn't, then I can't trust any of it. Because I don't have the power to discern that except as it is revealed to me by the Spirit of God and that is the thing that, my, that, that I must trust and that I must hold to and that I must cling to. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. This is the love of God. That we keep His commandments. Do you understand by this that I can't just decide on my own that I'm going to keep God's commandments? The fact that I am able to keep His commandments, the fact that I have any desire to keep His commandments, the fact that I even understand any of His commandments is proof of God's love in my life. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Without His love, we don't even know where to start. Without His love, we're going to give up. Without His love, we're going to wear out. Without His love, we aren't going to be able to stay the course. Over the years, there have been those from time to time I've heard people say, well, I, I, you know, I don't want to join the church. I'd have to give up too much. I'd have, to, I'd have to quit this and I'd have to quit that. And I'd have to give up something else. Do you love God? His commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not designed to cause us to lose joy, but rather to gain joy. His commandments are not to make life hard for us. Instead, they are to make life better for us. The commands that God gives us to live 
by and, and to go by and to serve one another by and therefore serve him with are not grievous. They are just the opposite of that. They're glorious and they're good and they're wonderful. And they're hard for our own of nature sometimes. They are not grievous. For, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So I got to believe to overcome. Where does that come from? Do I just decide one day, okay, it's time for me to start believing what God said and doing what God said to do and live like God said to live? Can I just, do I just wake up one morning and decide, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give this God thing a try. I'm going to go to church and I'm going to be baptized and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do something else. Left to ourselves, none of those things would ever happen. None of those things would ever mean anything to us. It's got that on our sign. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And the rest of that scripture says, and that not of yourselves. That doesn't come from me. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I had somebody say to me one day, well, is that the grace or is that the faith? And my answer to that is yes. Both the grace and the faith that comes by that grace are the gift of God. It is not of yourselves. It is not something that we generate within ourselves. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. You say, well, how can I go out here and overcome all this, this ugliness in the world? I'm going to tell you something. I got a little world right here that's mine to overcome. As do each and every one of you. And if we overcome this world, then the love of God and the grace of God is going to be multiplied in their lives to God's praise and honor and glory. And we're going to persevere in that and we're going to, to, to be uh, uh, constant in that and we're going to give God the glory for that. And this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. You see, by our faith in God, we overcome the world. No, I don't overcome all the evil in the world. I overcome my fear of the evil that's in the world. No, I don't overcome uh, all, all, the, all the trouble and all the trial and all the tribulation, but I overcome the, the doubt or the concern. I overcome that, that little niggling thing. I, I remember hearing somebody say one time, uh, whenever, whenever the Twin Towers fell, where was God? Now, I'll be the first one to confess there have been times in my life when I didn't understand what God was doing. Or when I didn't understand why he allowed some of the things to happen that happened. But praise be to his holy name that he allowed me the faith that not once did I ever question whether or not he was there, whether or not he was present, whether or not he was in control, whether or not that his power was what it had always been and would always be. My faith was sufficient to overcome the world, the doubt, the fear, the, 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 the questioning of uh, and, and, and now, you know, we, we all have our moments. Scripture said David was a man after God's own heart. And David, who was a man after God's own heart, said one time, is the Lord clean gone forever? Lord, have you just left me? Have you abandoned me and you're not coming back? Because, see, that's, that's the other thing about you. Notice the statement, is the Lord clean gone forever? 
If he'd never been there, David would know he was gone, would he? I can't say you're gone from my house if you've never been to my house. David said, is the Lord clean on forever? But if you continue reading David's writings, you're going to know that 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 that, that that question became more of a rhetorical thing. And, and it, the, the few times in my life that I have been brought to a place where I thought, Lord, have you abandoned me? Lord, or, 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 am, am, I, am I finally just by myself? Almost before I could think that thought, my heart would say, you know better. Almost before the thought would get out there. He said, well, I can't help but think. No. But I, you know, sometimes thoughts come unbidden. No. They just, one minute you're going along and, and this is happening, and all of a sudden this thought pops up. They're not always good, are they? But again, I'll remind you of what an old preacher used to tell us whenever I was a kid growing up in the mountains. Somebody would say to him, well, I can't help what I think. He said, no, I can't help a bird flying over my head either, but I don't have to let him build a nest in my head. I might not be able to help what I think, but I don't have to give it a place to live. It doesn't have to stay with me. I can, by God's grace and mercy, by the faith that he has given me, rebuke that and overcome the world. Now, who is he that overcometh the world? He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And I ask you again, can you just up one day and decide, well, I'm going to believe that. I'm going to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I'm going to believe that a virgin gave birth to a son. I'm going to believe that God chose to become manifest in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm going to believe that God who spoke the world into existence, by the way, how do you believe that God spoke the world into existence? There's a whole lot of science out there that's not going to tell you that, that's not going to agree with you on that. There's a lot of people out there that are going to tell you that's absolutely stupid. Quite frankly, I don't find that any, uh, nearly as hard to believe as, as, as that, that a bunch of gases just suddenly one day got together and there was this great big explosion and all of this beauty and order was, was the result of that thing blowing up. No, no. I tell you, as far as I'm concerned, that takes a whole lot more faith than believing in God does. <laughs> Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Of God. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So you see that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So we're right back to the first verse, you know. Do you really believe that Jesus is the Christ? That he is the only access you will ever have to the Father. And that you can't get to him unless the Father draws. You, you see where that leaves us? Pretty much out of the picture, doesn't it? No man comes to me except the Father which sent me draw him. I will not come to Jesus Christ unless the Father first takes action in my heart. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So I, I'm not going to come to Jesus unless the Father first works in my heart and draws me there. And then I'm not going to see the Father until I come to Jesus. Because I don't have the power. You see, I don't have the strength. Sometimes we, 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 we want to talk about, you know, how unjust and how unfair sometimes the things of God are. How, you know, how merciful. That's what we ought to be talking about because if he had just left us alone, that's where we'd be, is alone. We would never have sought him. 
we would never have felt his peace. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is true. Jesus came to John to be baptized. John was going to refuse him. I can't baptize you. If you're here, I'm the one that needs to be baptized. What did Jesus tell him? John behooved us to fulfill all scripture. Understand that Jesus came into this world still under the law service. The Old Testament was still in full effect. Those were the laws that they were governed by and those were the scriptures that they taught and that they learned from. Remember who John the Baptist's daddy was? He was a Levite. He was a priest. That means that John the Baptist was also a Levite. Under the law, the priest had to wash the sacrifice. cleansing water and was proven thereby that he was the only begotten son of God because the spirit descended from heaven as it were a dove and the voice of God spoke from heaven and said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased skip forward some three and a half years we see this beloved son nailed to a cross pouring out his life's blood with this declaration I lay my life down no man taketh it from me proving again that he is really the son of God when he said father into thy hands I commend my spirit and he gave up the ghost. And three days later, he walked out of the borrowed tomb, alive and alive forevermore, king of kings and lord of lords, by water and by blood, and it is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. If you are able to say amen to any of, uh, of that that I have just said before you and to all of that that I have said before you, it is because the Spirit of God dwells in you and with you and has revealed His truth to you. Because I'm going to tell you that otherwise those things are impossible for a man to believe. Otherwise it's just a fairy tale. I used to love Greek mythology. Enjoyed reading it. It was just a big adventure tale to me. See, I, I, I know that those, that, that those characters were all referred to as gods, but see, I knew they weren't gods. <laughs> that there was only one god. But you see, what's, what's heartbreaking to me is that there are multitudes of people out there who read these stories about the God that you love and worship and they see him just like you see Zeus. He's just 
another fairy tale. And you know what? You can't convince them any different. But the spirit, the spirit, if when the spirit comes to them and bears witness, they don't have any trouble believing it then because the spirit is truth. Whenever the truth is manifest, whenever the truth is revealed in their heart, they don't have any trouble believing it then, do they? Because see, once the truth is revealed, I'm not saying you can't deny it, but you can't unbelieve it. You see, I've been taught the, the scientific truth all of my life that uh, the world is round. I think there's, I think there's plenty of evidence for that. There are some people out there that still insist that the world is flat. I, I was actually a little surprised, surprised to learn that a few years ago. That there are still people that insist that the world is flat. That's okay. I'm not mad at it. But it gives us a very different view of the world today. And I've heard some of them make the claim that that's my truth. But you see, my truth don't make anything real. My truth satisfies my notions. It doesn't make anything real. And, and, and we've come in, uh, to, a, to a place in our society where that, that, that we think truth is, is quantitative or that, you know, that truth depends on who's telling the story. Uh, and again, granted, you know, for, we may stand from a different place and have a different perspective of things. If I ask you to describe the label on this little bottle of water sitting right here, your description's not going to be the same as mine because we don't have the same view. But one thing we'll have to agree on is that it's a little bottle of water, right? The basic proof of what it is, we have to agree on. Our perspective may cause us to see it a little differently. But Jesus is the truth. And the Spirit reveals the truth. The Spirit is the truth. And once you understand the truth, I'm going to tell you, you can't unbelieve it. Now, you can say all day long, but that's not really a bottle of water. Hmm? You can say it all day long. That's, that's not a bottle of water. That's a cup of coffee. I can say it all day long. But my heart knows that in spite of any claim I might make to the contrary, that's a little bottle of water. And I haven't had a cup of coffee in about two hours. See, my point is, once you know the truth, you might not always admit it, but that doesn't change what you know. Now, not admitting it is going to change how you enjoy what you know. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in the one. The water, the baptism of Jesus Christ, manifested the Son of God. The shedding of his blood on the cross manifested the Son of God. And the spirit bears witness to us of the Son of God. These three agree in one, in that they all bear record of this one thing, that Jesus is the Christ, <coughs> that he is the Son of God, that he is worthy of our trust, that he is worthy of our glory, that he is worthy of our praise. I'm out of time. <laughs> I don't know where the first Sunday morning goes. Trust me, there's a whole lot there that we haven't gotten to yet. We may never, but, but uh, go home and read it. Go home and meditate on it. <coughs> Thank God for your grace and mercy.
And we ask all these continued interest in your prayer. God bless you.